Good morning, my friend. So good to see you made it here today because as always, we have gathered here in the name of Jesus Christ. Glory be to God, he is alive. He lives and with his life, our hope is alive. I truly believe it is by the power of God's good spirit that he has drawn us together today gathered us together to reveal to us his wisdom and his love. And for that, I'm very thankful you are here. Keep us in your prayers. Keep me, my family, my father in your prayers. He has cancer, has been recently diagnosed with cancer, and there's nothing we can do. And, and, and all of this and everything we're talking about and all of our faith and, and these teachings and instructions are all about preparing us for the last enemy. And, and, and even though we talk about, you know, one of our enemies being the devil, his lies, and warding them off with the shield of faith, one of our enemies is an addiction, of some sort, one of the enemies is, is a spirit uh, of depression. Some of our enemies are those who violated us when we were vulnerable, whether we were abused as children or exposed to a traumatic event somewhere in life. When we were vulnerable, we were abused by circumstances that were outside of our control and in all of it the last enemy the greatest enemy the strongest enemy of all is sickness the end of life sickness and death because in that you really find what you truly are you find that there there's no one escape from it there's no escape from it. And I'll tell you, some of the greatest trials and acts of tribulation you're ever going to be exposed to is that end of life thought, experience, sickness, death. Even if, if we came and God came in and poured out the wrath of his desire through the seven spirits spoken of, and the book of Revelation and all the world came crashing down on everybody. And, and indeed, it is going to. There will come a day when everything from this world is absolutely going to vanish and cease to exist, including you. And so in all of this, we're, we're preparing for that day. And even when you're prepared, even when you are strong in faith, you're still going to experience a sense of anxiety and fear and unknowns. You're going to find the, the, the truth behind what, what strength in you, what, what makes you strong. Where, where is the courage in you? What makes your courage real? An absence of faith, it's just magnified tenfold. The fear, the anxiety, the stress of it all, the realization that there is a force greater than all of us. Death itself. And death is the wages of sin. And we certainly are 
going to be paid in full. But without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. And so this week we're talking and dedicating ourselves to step six in the 12 steps of a biblical healing and recovery, which is passionate love and finding a sense of passionate love for something or someone. And yesterday, or in the last video, we spoke about finding a, a passionate love for ourselves and, and being dedicated, devoted, passionate a, a, about overcoming, recovering from an addiction, a bad spirit, whatever it may be. the effects from being abused as a child, being passionately in love with ourselves in, 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 in such a way we, we, we won't be denied what we're gonna grab hold of the recovery from PTSD. Because that's what it is. That's what it is, is we're suffering from PTSD and with that comes side effects, and we're seeking to recover from those side effects. And in the recovery of it, it gives us the strength, the courage, the hope, and the faith to be able to stand up against an enemy so powerful, none of us, rich, poor, wise, unwise, free or slave, male or female, it doesn't matter who we are. We're gonna face a, a power greater than, than all of us. And that's sickness and that's death. And so in all of it, and if you go back through the teachings and instructions that we've been going through, we're, we're trying to learn how to trust other people. And for us and our family, I have no trust at all in the American medical field. I just don't. But we gotta learn trust because in all of it, there's gonna come that day when, when we must entrust our, our well-being, our health, our, our bodies, our spirit, our, our everything to a stranger, a stranger, and we gotta hope and that somewhere there, there's a good God working in our lives and around the world that's gonna empower that stranger with some compassion and some sympathy and, and a little bit of love and the wisdom to be able to deal with the things we consider necessary for our well-being. I mean, everybody talks about it. I'm ready to meet the Lord until the Lord says, okay, today's the day. Well, not today. I mean, I'm at tomorrow, next year, 10 years, five years from now. So I, all this stuff is extremely important. And I pray and hope you would find it to be important for yourself. Keep us in your prayers. My Father needs your prayers. We need your prayers. I mean, it's probably the, the very least you could do or offer. And in that, it might be the most powerful thing you could offer. So we're talking about passionate love and being passionately in love with something. And, and my prayer and my hope for you is that you would come to recognize and understand what, when we're talking a biblical sense of passionate love, we, we want to be passionately in love with Jesus Christ. 
with Jesus Christ, the Savior and our healer. And, and he displays a sense of passionate love for us. And sometimes, you know, we, we learn that uh, things that are greater than passionate love, right, is devotion, being devoted to something. But passionate and being passionate is a, a sense of devotion and discipline found in that. We, we have to discipline ourselves to be able to come up with the power or that force to be devoted to something with great passion. And our desire is to be passionately in love, in love with Jesus Christ, who is passionately in love with us. And in that, it produces persistence, relentlessness. It's unending. And again, we see why are passionate people so attractive? And I, and I pray and hope this is what makes Jesus Christ attractive to you. We tend to gravitate toward people who seem to have taken the time to become certain on things that we are uncertain about. Education. That's why we are educating ourselves through the teachings and instructions of the Bible so that, so that we are certain about things. We're, we're certain about our hope. We're certain uh, about our faith. And we're certain about God's passionate love that's available to us. Passionate people usually come off as having a lot of self-assurance and certainty in the things they say. And sometimes a display of passionateness, passionate love is not necessarily displayed through the things we say. What defines them and makes it so attractive are the things they don't say and yet are able to stand in that certainty of what they believe. That's the things they don't say. That makes it so attractive, that makes it so believable. We see here in Matthew's chapters 26 verses 48 and on into the end of the book of Matthew as we're talking about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and, and him being passionate about your well-being. Being passionate about your well-being. I mean, everybody, and I recognize and I understand, everybody, for, for the sake of, of their own pride, their own ego, their own insecurities, that they certainly want to watch you and see you bow down and accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That, that makes me feel good. It's comforting to me, but let me tell you the truth about Jesus Christ and his love for you that he was quite certain. He was convinced, convicted, that, that, that you were going to perish. You were going to perish because of the things you did in your life made you an enemy to God. You were enemies to God. You, 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 no one sought God and no one did good. And there was good in nobody. Everyone went away and walked after their own desires. No one sought God. They, they were enemies to God. And while they were in the midst of being God's enemy, Christ said, I, I got to do something. God said, we got to do something because all of them all together, because no one does good, are going to perish. In the same way when God flooded the earth with the waters back in Noah, there was nobody left except for the eight. Noah, his sons, their wives, and his wife. 
only eight human beings and and it was so bad and so so rotten in the world that Christ said, I must do something, we must do something. What is it we can do in order to prevent them from perishing? I mean, God made the world and everything in it and he said it was good. And even man being created in his own image, God was well pleased in that and, and it was good. And with our free will, we, we went out into the world and we began to destroy it and we began to destroy one another for the sake of greed and for the sake of pride and out of a, a, a no idea of the ramifications of those decisions. And God saying, I, I can't even allow that because they have wisdom. They know the difference between right and wrong and yet choose wrong. There's no way I, I can find joy in creating that. Even though God allows evil and all the stuff to be in that because in it, it produces his own righteousness, his, his own sense of love. It, it's a display of his passionate love for a creation that doesn't necessarily reflect the goodness of who he is or what he is. None were righteous. But God making a promise to Abraham, I'll bless the world through your seed. The seed being just Jesus Christ. I, I will bless the world through Jesus Christ. And, and Jesus Christ, when he's saying, God, what are we going to do? Because everything is being destroyed. And it's being destroyed by the power of their own will and their own desires and their own choices. These, these things you created in your own image. Is this truly a reflection of who you are? And God's saying, no, it is definitely not a reflection of who I am. What are we going to do about it? Is there anything we can do about it? Well, my, my desire is that in you, all things were created. And nothing was created unless it was created through you. Christ was the Word, and the Word was God. And then the Word became flesh. We were able to behold the unseen image of God and we saw it in Jesus Christ. The unseen image of God we saw in Jesus Christ. He is the true glory of God's unseen image in our world, in flesh. And it's not a, a, a matter of well, what color was his eyes and what color was his skin and what, how long was his hair? And did he really have a beard or not a beard? It, it wasn't about a, a physical attributes that made him God. It, it, was, it was the spirit and the love and this passionate desire for you to know God to know the truth behind God. All the people in Jesus' day and on that time, they said, we know God. They said, we love God. They said, we are the chosen people that God has decided to reveal himself through the world too. If anybody's gonna know God, it's gonna know God because of us. And they had no idea how true that statement was. And yet all the while, the God they were worshiping was the devil himself. It was Satan. As Jesus said, if you really knew God, then you would have loved me. If you really knew what you were talking about when you say, I know God, I love God. If that was an absolute statement of truth, you would have loved me. You would have loved me. But Christ came and 
in order to open their eyes and to get them to stop following after the lies and the deception of Satan who had been in their lives for so many years, hundreds of years, and had deceived them into believing that he was God. And by worshiping him and, and dedicating their lives to him, they were going to get the, the promises that that false god had promised them, which was riches and glory from the kingdoms of this world. And they would do anything for the riches of this world. And, and I think a lot of people do the same today. I'd do anything for a little more money. I'd do anything for a few more possessions. Jesus is saying, I'd do anything for you to know the depths of God's love. And none of this stuff can express the love of God. It's tainted with sin. It's tainted with deception and the sin and the deception that it's tainted with is sickness and death. Things we definitely have no control over and in that God displays his power that by the power of one man's sin there with Adam and Eve, death came into the world and not just to him, it came into all the world, whether they sinned or didn't sin, whether they knew Adam or didn't know Adam, no matter where they were in the world, all things began to die. Because why? God said, God said, if you eat of that, you will die. And the, the, the power behind God's word and that truth is a reality, and that reality has stretched out since the first human being, and it'll be here all the way until the last human being. That is how powerful and strong the word of God is. And you can't escape it. In the same way, we can't escape death and sickness and illness. We can't escape Jesus Christ. And it is by the power of the righteousness of one man, all things can be reconciled, be made whole, can be redeemed. This is how grace, God displays his grace in our life, that, that while you were in the midst of sin, while you were in an enemy, he reconciles himself to us. He lays down his life for us. It's not a, a, a question of earning. And he does this so no man may boast. You can't earn it. You can't grab hold of it. There's nothing you can do other than believe in it. And his desire is to show you the grace. It is gift. Is an absolute gift to you. There is no purchasing of it. And, and so we see, as he was saying, as God and Jesus are saying, that you were going to perish because you, you had no recognition or understanding of, again, the ramifications of your choices and your acts. But God being passionate about his word and his promises seeks to deliver you, to deliver us, whoever we may be throughout the world. And so Jesus begins to display his passionate love in this way. Chapter 26, verse 48 of the book of Matthew. Now the betrayer had given them a sign saying, the one I will kiss is the man sees him. And he came up to Jesus at once and greetings rabbi and kissed Jesus and said to him, and Jesus said to him, friend, do what you came to do. And he kisses him, and it's all of it is to fulfilling the scripture. And this is how and why we believe Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the Son of God. 
God the Father. That God the Father revealed himself through the Son, the Messiah, the chosen vessel, which God displays himself through or reveals himself through. It wasn't so much of what Jesus said or what Jesus did. It was what they did. And it was what they said that made it the truth. I mean, all Judas had to do was not kiss him on the cheek and it would have nullified the prophecies. All, all Jesus had to do, if, if, you, if, you, if you, all he had to do, he had within his own power, within his own strength, to not cast the 30 pieces of silver back into the house of God. If Judas wanted to with his own free will and his own choices, and he had that available to him, all he had to do was not betray Jesus Christ, not to hand him over to anyone. In the same way, the centurion soldiers did not have to gamble over his clothing, his garments. They had choice, they had free will. And with their choices and their free will, they proved Christ was who he said he was. They proved Jesus was the Messiah. Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. And behold, one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. We know from the other gospels, Peter pulled out his sword. And I get it, and, and people say all the time, you know, we, we should go buy a sword and protect ourselves and, and, and protect our, our loved ones. And, and, you know, those who live by the power of the sword are definitely going to die by the sword. And that continues on with guns. You, you live by the power of a gun, you will die by the power of the gun. It isn't enough. It's not going to suffice. It won't protect you. It isn't going to add one day onto your life. These things are outside of your control. They're outside of your power, your wisdom, your choices, or even your desires. You have no ability to add a day to your life. What you have is the ability to, to passionately, with love, trust in Jesus Christ. That's, that's a gift from God. And that's what God will give you. It says to them, don't let your hearts be troubled. Don't weep for me. Believe in me. And I'm going, and I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will return to take you to that place. We're placing our, our passionate love in the hands of Jesus Christ. In the wisdom of God. In the righteousness of God. in the faithfulness of God. She said to him, put away your sword back into its place for all who take the sword will perish by it. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once send more than 12 legions of angels. But how then should the scriptures be fulfilled that it must be so? 
Jesus saying, I, I don't need your protection. And maybe that's something I, in my own life, struggle with. Having a church, a church with no people that come, having an online ministry that has people that have no desire to show any support, whether it is spiritual support, physical support, mental support, any support at all towards me and my struggles or my problems. No, no encouraging word comes into me. Jesus saying, I, I am, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the greatest and the least. I am the first and the last. And we're going to be passionately in love with him being in control. In control and recognizing and grabbing hold and harnessing and receiving his passionate love for us that says, I will not allow you to perish. See, see, it wasn't, it wasn't about, because you so loved God, Jesus Christ came into the world to deliver you. It never says that. It says, because God so loved you. Christ came into the world to deliver you. And Jesus said, I came to save you. To save you from the things that were way out of your control. I came to save you from the power of a choice, not even of your own. I came to save you not from your own free will or your choices. I came to save you because God so loved you. Because God so loved you. And everyone who believes in that has eternal life. And those who don't believe are still being punished. And the reason they're still being punished is because they don't believe in God's love. So the punishment isn't that God is sitting there punishing you. The punishment is a, a self-harm. I'm punishing myself. I'm hurting myself for not believing in the love of God. And because I can't believe in the love of God, I can't even display from myself a desire to be passionately in love with anything. Myself or anyone or anything. It's a self-inflicted wound. Jesus saying, I have the power to protect myself. I have the authority over all the hosts of heaven. And even one angel, as we've seen in the Old Testament, is more powerful than 100,000 human beings. One. And I could call upon over 12 legions of angels. But my desire isn't to deliver myself. My desire is to display to you the depths of God's love. At that hour, Jesus said to the crowds, I'm out against a robber. with the swords and clubs to capture me. Day after day, I sat in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me, but all this has taken place that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples left him, and they fled. <laughs> Do 
fulfilling the scriptures. The words of prophets thousands of years ago that if we strike the shepherd, the sheep shall scatter. And, and if Christ wasn't who he said he was, and we see it all the time, people come up, I'm, I'm all, all powerful and I'm all this and that, and, and when, when their life is taken, their, their followers and, and everything just disappear. And it comes to nothing. But because everything Christ said, everything they said about Christ, and everything these people did in their lives proved Christ true. And as Christ said, I am eternal. My salvation is eternal. My righteousness is eternal. My love for you and the steadfastness of it is eternal. And that's how we are thousands upon years later. And, and even though, you know, the one of the most persecuted religions on earth are those who believe in Jesus Christ. There's more mar martyrs, people who, who were killed for their faith, who were Christians than any other religion. Other religions claim that, that if I kill in the name of God, I'm a martyr. <laughs> But that's the opposite of the Christ's teachings. We lay our lives down, not, not as an army soldier. That's a deception coming from Satan. We lay our lives down in, in saying, there's no way for me to enter into the righteousness of God without the blood of Jesus Christ covering over me, without the atonement made, without Christ There's no way. We see that passionate love is empowered through the acts of the Holy Spirit. And that's why we have the book of Acts, the acts of the Holy Spirit alive within the apostles that, that gave them the sense of a passionate love that sent them all across the world. We see it even in with Paul and, and all the beatings <laughs> and the imprisonments that he took. I won't be denied, and even if you kill me, even if you imprison me, you, you can't bound the word of God. It will continue on. And that's something I think sometimes I have to come to grips with in my own life. Obviously, you don't need me. I, I am nothing, and I mean nothing to this world. And there will come a day when everybody on this world would, would never care one moment if I existed or didn't exist. I don't matter in the sense of this world, in the eyes of the world. The only thing that matters is my love for God. God will always be here. Jesus will always be here. Because he is the light of all men. He is the light of human beings. Then those who seized Jesus let, led him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders gathered. And Peter was following him at a distance, as far as the courtyard of the highest priest. And going inside, he sat down with the guards to see the end. And I know all of them, including even Judas, all of them surely believe that, that this is what's going to happen. They're going to take Jesus and Jesus is going to be there with the high priests and all the, the authorities that may be. They're going to listen to him. He's going to do a few miracles and wonderful things. 
that is going to prove his godship. And they're going to anoint Jesus to be king of the Jews. And with Jesus being the king of the Jews and the power to rise the dead and heal the sick, he's going to go out with a massive army and he's going to take over Rome. And the end of the oppression of the Roman Empire. This, this is something that they, I'm sure they thought of and, and believed that, that once they meet Jesus, or once they come to know the Jesus we have known, they're going to recognize and understand that the power of God is with him and his love is for Israel. Can you imagine uh, having a king who had the power to rise the dead back to life, who had the power to heal the sick and the cripples and, and the lame, and to be able to go at war with, with this mighty army uh, against a foe who had been oppressing the people with wickedness and evil and, and crucifixions and taxation. And to their surprise, he went up there and he, he, he said nothing. He performed no miracles and he says nothing. And Jesus, do the miracles as the miracles you, you did for us. Show them your signs and your wonders. Show them the power of the living God amongst you. And, and he says nothing. Man comes up and says, This man said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. And, and of course, the, the, the temple of Solomon, this, this temple made by the strength of a man's hands. And God said to Solomon, and he said to him, Oh, I will not live within that temple or anything constructed by the hands of man. It can't contain me. The heavens can't contain God. The universe and all of creation can't contain God. Because God is all in all. He is all of it. And nothing can contain God. Nothing can put God in a box. And yet that's what we do. Every day of our lives as we live and we go on, it, it feels so comfortable to be able to put our God in, in a nice little box so I can understand him, I can look at him, I can have a little power over him, and I can display my God to everyone in my box. And God's saying, you know, I'm so uncontainable, I'm so powerful, You can't even escape death. You cannot even escape sickness. Yet we're trying to put God in, in some sort of a box. Can't do it. Can't be done. Temple was himself. See, that's what it means to be passionately loved, devoted, persistent. What was the truth behind God? I am the temple of the living God. And he knew it. He was certain about it. And he didn't have to go out and say, well, I got to do these things to prove it to you. I, I mean, everybody says, prove it, right? They say it to us all the time. Your God is so big and so loving and so real. Prove his existence. Jesus, I don't have to prove anything. All I have to do is believe in it. Believing in it is what creates for us the sense of passion. It's just like Peyton Manning, you know. Not everybody in the world is, is the world's greatest football quarterback. And I don't know if he is the greatest or, or not, but we see with him a sense of worth, work ethics. 
passionate love and being so passionately in love and the desire to be the best, you can see it through his actions. He wanted to be just like his dad. He wanted to be the greatest quarterback that had ever lived. And so he worked harder than anyone else around. Didn't have the strongest arm, wasn't the fastest guy, wasn't the most athletic, but he was the most determined. And Jesus saying the same thing. I believe in it and I believe in certainty. See, Peyton Manning believed in it. He believed and if I do this and I do that and I practice and I work hard and I do, I will achieve my goal. Jesus saying the same thing. I want to be like my dad. Who's a life giving spirit. Who's the king of the world, king of the universe, king of the Jews. And him saying and displaying that certainty of his passion and that faith, I don't have to do anything to prove it. You're going to prove it's true. You will prove it's true. His passion was in the authority God gave him. I will tear down this temple and three days rebuild it. God has given me the, port, the authority to lay down my life and then rise it up again. And in that, we are in Christ. Christ's authority is not only for himself, but for us so that we would have the assurance and the hope to be able to tackle the devil on that day. When we become sick, we will become, when death comes knocking on our door. Jesus, again, has no answer to them. He doesn't try to defend himself. I mean, they're, they're, they're about to crucify you. They're about to kill you. Why won't you even defend yourself and, and even say, you know, you're a liar, you're a deceiver, anything. I'm just going to say nothing as, as a lamb being led to the shears. Absolutely silent. Through all the accusations. Remember, he, he came to bear our sins. And so all those who were worshiping the devil and the devil and, and Judas and the spirit of the devil in them and, and accusing Jesus of all these horrible things and, and in that Jesus is taking on the accusations that were due us. And say nothing. Because I came to take away the sin of the world. And then we look and it, by his stripes we were healed. By his wounds we have found our healing. His stripes, his wounds, the display of God's passionate love in our lives. What is it that these men testify against you? But Jesus remained silent. And the high priest said to him, I adore you. By the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus said to him, you have said so. But I tell you from now on, you will see the Son of Man sitting or seated at the right hand of power. 
in coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robe and said, he has uttered blasphemy. Now the witnesses we do, we don't need. Do we need? We have heard his blasphemy. And the blasphemy he was saying was, I am God. I am God. You said I was the Son of God. You said I am the Messiah. And Jesus responds in a roundabout way because Baal was the God of war. Zeus was the God of war. Baal and Zeus had a couple things in common that they would come riding on the clouds with all the hosts of heaven to make war against their enemies. And so in a roundabout way, they knew what he was talking about. He was saying, I am God. This is blasphemy. The Muslims all across the world and all the Jews together agree that a man can't be God. That's blasphemy. That's why they don't believe in Jesus. They don't believe in the Jesus of this Bible. They don't believe in the forgiveness of sin. They don't believe in the passionate love of God. And so they're always trying to earn his love trying to display a sense of their own righteousness. And in that, the world is full of hatred, death, greed, maliciousness. No matter how hard they try to establish righteousness, in the eyes of God, it is dirt. It's dirty rags. It's worthless. It will never suffice. They answered, he deserves death. Then they spit in his face and they struck him. And they slapped him. Say, prophesy to us, you Christ. Who struck you? And again, Jesus displaying this passionate sense of love that I came in the world to reconcile you with God. I came in the world to take away your sins. I came into the world to take on the punishment you so deserve. And they're sitting there, accuse us of not being loved by God. Accuse us of not being worshipers of God. And Jesus sets back in silence. I accuse nobody of nothing, and I will judge nobody. And everybody that comes to me, I will not cast out because God has entrusted me with the well-being of all his creation. While we were in the midst of sin, Christ laid down his life for us. Then we hear about Peter denying me. A few days ago, Peter saying, I'm ready to die with you. I'm ready to go with you to the authorities, to the high priest, to the elders of our community. And defend your right to life. Jesus saying, you don't have the strength. You don't have the power. You can't defend me. I didn't come into the world to be defended. I didn't come into the world to be saved. I don't need a savior, says the Lord our God. 
I came to save you. They began to ask Peter, don't, don't you know this man? And after seeing the treatment Jesus was to endure, and began to see that, hey, I, I'm in a place all of a sudden where I'm not in control. And there's forces and things that are in control right now that are far greater and more powerful than me. I don't know the man. I mean, we, we, we think we have the power to save our lives. We, we want to believe that we're going to be vigorous and strong all the way up until the day of our death. But the truth is we're going to find that we're going to be filled with anxiety and fear and all the things that make us realize how weak and vulnerable we really are and how out of control we are and how in control God is and that everything God says is, is beyond our escape. I can't escape being sick. I can't escape being harmed. I can't escape from being vulnerable. I'm not even going to deal with it. I don't know the man. Another person says, aren't you the friend of Jesus? I saw you with Jesus there. When you did. You're the guy who cut off high priest guard's ear. I'm telling you, I don't know the man. Leave me alone. I've never seen him before. Three times Peter denies Jesus because it was an attempt to save himself from the harm and the destruction he was watching Jesus and having to endure. Now it's real. It's all fake. It's all fantasy. It's all myth. And until you're the one who has to die. Tell it's your turn. Then he's quickly reminded when the crow calls out. That Jesus told him, You're good. This is what you will do. You'll deny me three times. Peter's reminded of this. He weeps bitterly. Bitterly. And even G Judas comes to this realization. I, I betrayed innocent blood. I, I truly thought and believed he was going to display the power of God in the midst of you and that you would anoint him as king. But here you are breaking him down and destroying him. And they both wept bitterly. But Judas decides to take his life, the grief of it all. I'll save myself by ending my life. All of a sudden, he's trying to put forth the teachings of Jesus Christ. He who tries to save his life, lose it. But he who loses his life will save it. But it came... And salvation comes from recognizing I can't earn it. I can't display a sense of my own righteousness. It's impossible. And even though we go through these 12 steps and all these things and we're empowered by the Holy Spirit, that's the part I don't want you to forget. It is the power and the presence of the living God that makes it possible, not not my own strength, not my own power, not my own desire or even my own will. It is God alive in me that transforms me into the thing God wanted me to be. God so desired me to be likened to Jesus Christ. And so he says, this is the power I give to you. This is the authority I give to you. And as Jesus says, everyone who loves me can do the things I do. You have the power to lay down your life and rise it up again. The same power that lures Christ from the grave lives in you. And you are the temple of the living God. You are the temple 
of the living God. And that's why we want to be passionately in love with ourselves. Because right here is where God lives. How can I love God if, if I don't love me? And how can I love me if I don't love you? Again, he, he stays silent because he's certain about who he is and what he is. It's the passionate love of God alive in our reality. They mocked him. They tear out his beard. They beat him. He says nothing. They dressed him in a purple cloak, which was a, a mockery of a sign of royalty. Oh, this is the king of the Jews. Hail the king of the Jews. Jesus never claimed to be the king of the Jews. They said he was. You said I am, says the Lord. They even put it right above the cross. This is the king of the Jews. And they wrote it in three different languages. Is hung there with the other criminals. Everyone was mocking him. Everybody. If you are the Son of God, save yourself. And again, Jesus displaying that that sense of passionate love and conviction. I didn't come to save myself. I don't need a savior. I am eternal because I'm clean and without blemish, but I came to take on your sin. I came to take on your punishment. I came to reconcile you to God by displaying to you the righteousness of God. Love of God is a gift. Even some of the, 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 the guys on the cross, one of them is mocking Jesus. Save yourself and save us too. Climb down off the cross. Everybody wanted Jesus to blow out of his eyes lightning, fireballs. Prove to us you are the Son of God. And all the while he's saying, I'm, I'm proving it. I'm proving to you that I am the Messiah. I am who I say I am by allowing you to destroy me. By allowing you to mock me. came to atone for your sin. Take on the punishment I don't deserve so you may receive the righteousness you don't deserve. And in that we, we find the love of God and the intense, the intensity of the love of God through his passion, his relentlessness. And it is that love that leads us to a turning and a change within ourselves. One of the men on the cross next to him, one of the robbers says, I deserve to be here. 
My crimes justify me. I deserve to be here. And they crucify me rightly. I'm a criminal. I'm a thief. I'm a robber. But Jesus, this man, has done no sin. He is innocent. Jesus, when you enter into the kingdom of God, will you remember me? <coughs> Jesus says, I will. In fact, on this very day, we will enter into paradise. We'll enter into the presence of God together. I've been crucified with Christ there at Golgotha, there at Calvary. I've been crucified with Christ. No longer live, instead it is Christ who lives in me. If we are faithful to confess our sins, I deserve to be here. Jesus saying the same thing, oh certainly you do deserve to be here. You are one of the thorns within my cross, or my crown, the crown of thorns, and you're there, you deserve to be here. But God so loved you. I stayed silent. When, when they said, you know, when, when even Pilate said, you know what, how much authority I have over you, Jesus? I have the authority to let you go. And I have the authority to crucify you. Jesus says, you have no authority over me. And whatever authority you have came from above. So Pilate comes up with the idea, I'll tell you what. I'll, I'll see to it, you, you are let free. I'm going to show you grace. I'm going to show you love, Jesus. Because I believe you're innocent. I really don't believe in, in what these uh, accusations of these people. I'm a sound thinking mind and, and in that I have free will and I have an ability to choose. And I'm going to choose an option and I'm going to place an option in front of these people that will ensure your release. And so I'm going to choose the most nasty and disgusting man out there, I'm going to choose Barabbas, and yet it's interesting that the name Barabbas means son of God, son of the father, son of father. Barabbas was a rioter, a murderer. It was everything that represented what we be. There he is, son of the father. Who do you choose to release? Barabbas or Jesus? <clears throat> and of course they choose Barabbas. Again, if any of this was within your own free will, if any of this was within your own choices, certainly you could have chosen a different route. You could have chose something different, but because God was in control and all the people were saying and God saying that when he was prophesying to the prophets and the people thousands of years before Jesus, he wasn't saying, this is what you're going to do. This isn't what you might do. Boy, if you, if you continue down this path, it's going to be like this. No, he said, in the future, this is how it was. This is what it was. God is past, present, and future all at once. This is what you did. It's what you did.
It's beyond our will. It's beyond our choices. Just as death and sickness is beyond our choice and our will. Can not escape. And every knee shall bow. Everyone will be held accountable for what they've done. For what they did. And every tongue will confess Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. Everyone will confess that God so loved me. He gave me Jesus Christ so I would not perish. Your goodness and mercy follow me. Your goodness and mercy follow me. You anoint me with the Spirit of God. You anoint me from the top of my head down to my feet my cup overflows with your love your goodness and mercy follow me your goodness and mercy follow